You know, Jesus actually spent most of his adult life as a carpenter, uh, making, you know, tables, chairs, things like that. But then all of a sudden, one day, he abruptly changed occupation. We don't know what his parents thought of that. But one day, he goes to the local synagogue, and he picks up a scroll, and he reads a short passage from Isaiah. And then after he read that, he sat down. That was it. Basically, his first message. And, you know, sitting down was, uh, you know, that was the posture that rabbis, you know, the teachers of Israel would take. Now, you know, nowadays, they usually in the classroom, the teacher stands up. But not back then. A rabbi, when he was ready to teach, he would sit down. Remember, before the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went up on the mountain and says, he seen the crowds and his disciples, says, and when he sat down, he began teaching them. So that's what they would do. They would sit down, and he gives this uh, message. He sits down. And uh, when Jesus sat down, it was like he was changing jobs at that point. And in his first message, he basically he uh, summarizes that passage where he, it talks about that God loves Gentiles too. And, uh, and he spoke this in such a way as if he really knew that. And you could wonder, well, what, uh, you know, how did they respond? Did they clap loudly for him? You know, did they go, oh boy, that was a great message, you know, way, uh, uh, you know, good job, Rabbi. No. The, Right after he had shared this, they were so furious, they grab him, they take him out to the edge of a cliff, and they want to throw him over. They want to kill him. That's not normally the response you want to get for your first message. Uh, you know, I think a lot of pastors, if they uh, uh, had a response like that to their first message, they probably wouldn't have been stayed in the ministry. Anyway, that's... Uh, uh, his response, and as you're looking there, on the, if you are on the sheets, there point one. Um, you know, Jesus was a rabbi, among many things, but he was unlike other rabbis. And at the end of his longest sermon, in fact, the Sermon on the Mount, remember what it says, you know, what they said of him there in Matthew 7, it says, they were astonished because he spoke as one who had authority, not like their scribes, you know, their other teachers. So he's he was a rabbi, but not like their other ones. Eleven times in the Gospels, uh, Jesus gets called a rabbi, you know, a teacher. Uh, you know, back in those days, Israel as a nation didn't have much. Uh, they didn't really have power. They didn't have wealth. They didn't have armies because they were an occupied nation. The, the Romans were in charge. They were running the place by and large. And, uh, you know, what did they have, though? You could think of it this way. What did they have? They had a book. But it was a book unlike any other book. And it's a book that raised all the great questions of life and had answered them. I mean, Rome had its vast armies. Uh, Greece had its very sophisticated culture. Uh, Egypt had a lot of wealth. Phoenicia, well, they had ships. Israel, well, they were people of the book. And the rabbis knew the book, and they would teach the book. And Jesus taught it, but he didn't teach it like the other rabbis did. For one way, uh, a lot of the other rabbis, when they would teach, they would quote other rabbis and, uh, you know, to back up what they're saying. And that's, that's a good thing for normal folk to do, uh, for someone to uh, quote other people. So, or, for example, if, you, if a judge, when he makes his ruling or her ruling, that um, you, it's, it's a good thing when they quote other judges or other people you know, precedents in law. Because then you know they're, okay, they're, you know, what their ruling is, you know, in, in the ballpark where it should be, and, and it's not something they just totally made up. But Jesus didn't do that. He never quoted anybody else uh, except the scriptures. And so he didn't teach the way the other rabbis did. You know, he would say things like, truly, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you. He didn't quote others. And he was different from the other teachers, too, in that uh, normally uh, a really great teacher would also be aware of the things they do not know. Uh, like Socrates, a you know, great teacher, he, at one point he said this. He said that in many ways, he says, I know nothing. <laughs> uh, Jesus wasn't like that. And, and that, too, though, he makes sense. We, we appreciate that. There's nothing wrong with that of knowing what you know and then knowing what you don't know. 
Uh, you know, if you've got problems with your car, you know, you're probably not going to go talk to uh, your English teacher, you know. Uh, you know, if you've got problems with your knee or something, you're not going to talk to the plumber, you know. He knows plumbing. He doesn't know about knees, you know, unless... And, and same thing, you know, famous uh, atheist Richard Dawkins is a biologist. If you had a question about biology, he'd be a good guy to ask. He knows a lot about biology. But he's also made himself kind of an amateur theologian, and actually I wish everybody was an amateur theologian. But when he, when he dies into that, it becomes very obvious that he's not aware of the things he does not know. He's good in biology, it's obvious he's lacking in other areas. But that's okay, we expect that. People can't know everything about everything, but Jesus was different from all that. Do you know what's interesting? When you, every time he was raised a question about all kinds of stuff, he never had to say, I don't know. Or, boy, that's a good question. I'll get back to you on that. Or, you know, that, me and the guys, we'll talk that over and we'll, you know, we'll come up with something. No, he never had to do that. We have to do that. He never had to do that. Never said, I don't know. Not because he was arrogant. He wasn't. We know he was very humble. But he, was, he, knew, he knew this stuff and, and he was very confident in his conviction. You know, sometimes people today think that Jesus was just kind of this folksy country preacher who kind of rambled around the countryside saying these nice little catchy sayings and somehow accidentally started this big spiritual movement. You know, anybody who knew him back then would never have thought that. Uh, Jesus is totally unlike any other teacher they'd ever heard. Well, you know, and the Apostle Paul himself was brilliant and and yet he himself basically said that he's not even in the same ballpark intellectually as Jesus was. Uh, I mean, Jesus could, could help and the simplest person to understand something or he could stump the most sophisticated. He was a master teacher. In fact, his, uh, his teachings and his life story, uh, as recorded in the, you know, the four Gospels, those Gospels have been recorded in over uh, over 2,600 languages and growing. You know what the second book is or this, that's been translated the most, uh, what's in second place? The Adventures of Pinocchio. It's the second most translated book. That's been translated in, over, in about 260 languages. But still no comparison to the Gospels, over 2,600, huge gap. You know, uh, uh, and we've, we've known this, the Bible's the best-selling book of all time according to the Guinness Book of World Records. You know what the second most best-selling book is according to the Guinness Book of World Records? The Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> well, that, I, I just heard that and I thought it might be worth checking into to see if, that really, uh, if that's really true. But All right. But, you know, one could say this, oh, really, Jesus was really and is really, really smart. And that's a good thing, because it's hard. You don't want to follow someone who, you know, doesn't know what they're talking about. But, you know, even the way Jesus taught was different. You know, today, a lot of education is just, you know, is basically like, you know, open your head and we just pour in all this information into your brain and, and, and uh, you need to just be able to repeat it on the, on the test. You know, because, you know, what's the most... The most often question asked in college classes, will this be on the final? You know, because if it's not going to be on the final, there's no way I'm studying this. You know, is it on the final? But Jesus, when he taught, he, uh, he taught in a way that not only gave you new information, but it changed your life. He's, a, a, again, a master teacher. For example, like 9-11. Uh, uh, when 9-11 occurred in America, all of us probably can remember just where we were. That was a life-changing day and changed America. And we, don't have to, we didn't have to take notes on that where we were. We just remember it. It had that kind of impact. That's what Jesus' teachings did. It's it like once I remember I was on a, um, a short-term missions trip uh, to the uh, island nation of Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, we were there for two weeks and in the mornings, we basically taught vacation Bible school at a couple churches. In the afternoons, we did some manual labor helping to uh, construct a, uh, 
a church there on the island. So we were, as I mentioned, there two weeks. We had one day off, and on that day off, we uh, rented this bus, and we all went down to the most beautiful beach on Trinidad, there in the Caribbean, and uh, to go swimming. And so we were there, and it was there where I first had a uh, shark sandwich. They, you know, they had those lunch, you know, lunch wagon. It tasted a lot like chicken. Um, maybe a little fishy, but... Um, but I remember I was being out, and I was, we were swimming, and I was out of waves, probably about up to my neck, you know, kind of bobbing in the waves, and, and all of a sudden something hits my leg very hard. And, and, I, and I quick looked, but, it, but, you know, being that deep in the water, I couldn't, I couldn't see anything. You know, it's not like how we have, uh, you know, um, in our lakes around here where the sunfish like to nibble on your toes or something. You know, it wasn't that. This was something heavy hit my leg. And I, you could say, I, maybe you could say I had a religious experience then because uh, I quickly talked to Jesus and I got out there as fast as I could. And I still no idea about it. But my point is, I don't have to write that down to try to remember that. Uh, I just, you remember that kind of thing. And that's the way the teachings of Jesus were. You, they changed your life. You remembered those things. He didn't teach like the other teachers taught. So he was different from, even though he was a rabbi, different from their rabbis in many respects. You know, in our schools too, they like to major on um, teaching, or well, at least they used to, now it's so much social experimentation, but, you know, uh, uh, you know giving you facts and knowledge, you know, about things and, and uh, the values, you know, at least when they used to, we had the Ten Commandments years back, uh, which could teach values that way, but then they, you know, kind of left it up to the churches and and nowadays they don't even do that. But, but in Israel, it was very different. They didn't do it that way. Israel, uh, one of the things that they would use to teach their, everyone was uh, their primary text of Israel was uh, something that was repeated twice a day. Uh, uh, you know, put it on your, uh, stamp it on, you know, put it on your forehead, strap it on your arms, uh, paint it on your gates, uh, put it on your door, frame, uh, teach it to your kids. It was the first thing they said every morning. The last thing that was said at night was the great Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel. You can just see Moses stand out there talking to the people. You know, hear, O Israel. You know, listen up, guys. Get this. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's what they would wanted to get across. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, Jesus uh, went around teaching all who would listen, men, women, kids, which is a new thing. Back in the Roman world, generally, it was only males from wealthy families who could get a formal education. But Jesus, uh, as the years went by, Jesus' followers remembered what he did and how he taught everyone, and so they did, and they would teach and all who would listen. And they would use uh, often a format to, uh, it's come down in a word we still have today, a uh, 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 catechesis, where we get our word catechism from. It's just a teaching method that basically uses a question and answer format. But Jesus told his disciples this. Remember he said, Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me. That itself is just an amazing statement. I mean, no one else has said that, could say that. Buddha never said that. You know, Confucius never said that. Muhammad never said that. I mean, think of it. If one of you said that, you know, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. You know, we go, you know, a normal person would not say that. Just a nice guy would not say that. Either you're a, either that's really true or you're a madman. I mean, that's such an alarming statement. No normal person would say that. But he said it. We know it's true. But he said, go therefore and make disciples. Okay, how do you do that? And he gives us kind of a you know, formula for doing it. One first is teaching them to, to observe, to keep everything that I've commanded you. We're to, you're to teach them. And his disciples took that very seriously. And it says they, after that, were day after day, they were never stopped teaching. So one day, though, what Jesus was asked here, this passage that we read earlier in Mark 12, he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What does he do? He repeats the Shema this most famous, well-known verse to all the Israelites. 
He repeats it, but then he does an interesting thing. He adds a word. He says, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind. He adds that. Uh, And just, I think it brings again out this point. God has given us a mind. He wants us to use it and not waste it. You know, and his early disciples believed that God created everything. So they went out and they studied, you know, over the years and over the centuries, they studied all what God had made and they come up with all these uh, principles that we call scientific knowledge. And, uh, you know, as Augustine later said, all truth is God's truth. Now, no matter who says it, if it's true, it's, it's part of the way God designed things. So people go out and they discover a scientific principle or a mathematical formula or some aspect of your DNA. These are all just aspects of how God made the universe and how it's designed to work. You know, when Einstein came up with his formula, E equals MC squared, he didn't create that. He discovered that. That's how part of the, you know, the universe works, how it operates. And God wants us to do that, to discover again all these things that show how how things run. And we know that through the Dark Ages, and we've talked about this before, how uh, as the Vandals overtook Europe and uh, any, there are very few, but what libraries there were, were destroyed and the scrolls, a lot of the knowledge of the day was written on, the scrolls would crumble, you know, eventually disintegrate over time. So these communities of Christians would get together and they would they would uh, copy and recopy every manuscript they could get their hands on, not only the scriptures, but about geometry and about all these other areas of knowledge. They're the ones who kept it safe. And it's from these uh, early communities and monasteries that the first university came. Uh, The first one was in Paris in the 12th century. Uh, All the teachers had to be okayed by the Pope. after that, in the 13th century came Oxford and Cambridge and England. And, 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 the, and the motto of Oxford was Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is our light. And so all these uh, universities came to be. But all these, they were all started by followers of Jesus who remembered that he taught you're to love God with all your mind. These other areas too, your heart, soul, and strength, but also all your mind. And that we are to teach these things and all these things that... God had, had taught us. So they did that. And again, let me uh, make this point. Uh, uh, you know, again, part of the uniqueness of Christianity wasn't the Buddhists didn't start universities. Uh, the Muslims didn't start universities. Hindus didn't start universities. Even the atheists did not start universities. Uh, it was the followers of Jesus that did. And then later some atheists, oh, that's a good idea, and started their own. But it was Christians who started all this. And I think it all goes back to Jesus that love God with all your mind. Teach these things. And they took that seriously. Well, Martin Luther, he changed education again. Uh, he came up with the idea. Well, he didn't come up with it. He saw it. There it is in First Peter in many places. The priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. And so therefore he thought, you know, we need to teach everybody to read and write so that they can read the scriptures for themselves. And so he, uh, he actually would, came down pretty hard on parents who did not educate their kids or did not see that their kids would get an education. Uh, he, he wrote this about them. He said, in fact, he said, I, he's going to write a book about parents who neglect the education of their children. Here's what he, here's Coley Luther now. I shall really go after the shameful, despicable, damnable parents who are not parents at all, but despicable hogs and venomous beasts devouring their own young. He really didn't have a hard time expressing himself. Uh, They came down pretty hard on parents who didn't make, you know, that their kids didn't get educated. And I came across this too, it's kind of interesting. In America, the first law to require mass universal education was back in Massachusetts, 1647, But notice that the name they gave to this law. It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. (laughs) It says, it being, and here's what, quoting them, it being one chief product of that old deluder, Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures and to the end that learning may not be buried in the graves of our forefathers. 
And they thought ignorance is the devil's tool and that God is the God of truth. People need to learn these things. They need a, an education. In fact, one historian noted this. He said, one of the remarkable facts about American history is that within six years of landing in the Massachusetts wilderness, Puritans established what would soon become a reputable college. And here's taking from their first student handbook of that college, it says this, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And therefore to lay Christ as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. That was the student handbook for Harvard University. It'd be nice if they still had that handbook and followed that. Well, uh, you know, and we've all heard of Sunday school. Uh, you know, and that was, a, but maybe and didn't know how it got started. It started way back 1780 by, again, a follower of Jesus, a Christian named Robert Rakes. He saw the deplorable condition of the kids, how the, the whole generations were just being lost because for six days a week, these kids had to work in the mills and, you know, manufacturing places just in squalor. And so... Sunday was their only day off. So he said, I'm going to start a school on Sunday. It's going to be a free school for all these kids. And we're going to teach them to read and write, and we're going to teach them about God. Well, and the idea just took off like wildfire. And uh, many got on board then and said, boy, you know, educating our kids, who knew? And, you know, and they, this really took off. So Sunday school wasn't just, you know, a, uh, put on by a private you know, organization, you know, it wasn't just an hour before, you know, a church service on Sunday. I mean, it was one of the greatest educational triumphs of our world, Sunday school. Again, started by a Christian. I mean, we could go on and on and list all the major uh, achievements, educational achievements done by Christians, all because Jesus said you're to love God with all your mind. You're to teach these things to everyone. And they took that seriously. Not just a privileged few get to know everyone. I mean, the impact of this one man, Jesus Christ, on education is beyond measurement. That's why, again, we need to get back to Jesus, even to catch up with Jesus and his view on these things. There's never been anyone like him. Aren't you glad you're a follower of Christ? Man, there's no one like him. Never has been, never will be another like him. He's the one and only. Or a little more. You know, use uh, point three I have on there, uh, never stop learning. You know, use the uh, technology. Uh, some people uh, falsely assume that science and Christianity are in conflict with each other. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, you know, I don't have time, to, you know, here this morning to go into how many of the world's greatest thinkers have, have said plainly that our whole method of science could never have developed if it wasn't for a biblical view of creation and the world, the fact that it's orderly and that it's reasonable, that it's not just all chaos, that you don't know what's going to happen. Because you can't come up with a scientific principle that might work today, but if everything's chaotic, you don't know if it'll work tomorrow or the next day. There has to be some predictability here, and that led to the beginnings of science. In fact, most of, many, most, I'm not sure either one of of our, you know, the, some of the world's greatest scientists have all been Christian. There's, there is no conflict between Christianity and good science. Um, there, is a, um, there is a conflict between the Bible and bad science. This is where science is driven usually by, if you dig deep enough, by someone's moral agenda. They will deny that but you dig deep enough and you can find there's a moral agenda underneath some of these observations. Well, you know, and Christians were, uh, not always, uh, but usually were some of the first to embrace some of these uh, new technologies. In fact, Christians in Europe were, were some of the first to use, you know, horses were not native to Europe. When they were brought in, uh, the Christians were some of the first to use um, uh, these horse collars and um, you know, horse shoes to help, you know, make their use horses more useful and to care for the horses. You might not think of that as new technology, but it was back then. Um, the first uh, recorded use of a windmill 
was by a leader of a monastery because he wanted to uh, enable his monks to have more time to pray without spending so much time grinding the grain. So they used a windmill. Uh, the first uh, the mechanical clocks were invented by monks because they needed to know when they were supposed to pray. Uh, the first recorded uh, instance of eyeglasses is in a, mentioned in a sermon in 1300 because the Christian scholars needed something to help them study and read and so on. You know, so again, to love God with all your mind, you know, it includes this willingness to search out truth uh, wherever you may find it. Uh, uh, whether it's said by in the scriptures or whether it's said by an atheist, you know, or, or by, you know, if the devil comes up to a person, you know, and says two plus two equals four, you go, well, that's, that's true. That is a true statement. Two plus two really does equal four. I'm really surprised you would say that, but nevertheless, that statement itself is true. And so no matter where we find true, all truth is God's truth, no matter who says it. So that's where, uh, so we're, uh, it leads me to this point. To be uh, anti-intellectual is to be anti-Christian. Uh, sad to say, there have been so-called Christian groups that have been known to be anti-intellectual, and those groups were criticized for that, and rightly so, because God says, love God with all your mind, use them, teach these things. Well, you know, in, in fact, speaking of the new technologies of the day, you know, it was, it was like Billy Graham, for one, who first used uh, uh, or saw the potential for radio. And oh, man, how Christians criticize him for that, using the tool of the devil to spread the gospel. And he says, no, this is fantastic. I can reach so many more people with the gospel now. And then he was one of the first to see the power of television. You know, in his, wasn't his the hour of power, hour of decision, something uh, you know, it was, it was so popular for all those years. And, and then the, the power, he was one of the, some of the first to use satellite dishes. And, uh, you know, now, uh, and then the power of the, you know, internet to reach and educate people, you know, more and more people than he, than he could ever reach face to face. And now, of course, we have all these new technologies, you know, iPads and tablets and smartphones and all these things. And, I mean, these are, we have these amazing new ways to share the gospel to some who, people who we would never meet, so we'd be hard to reach, or to get into countries and places where missionaries cannot go. These are amazing. You know, so in terms of education, uh, it is amazing what we have available to us and for our use. I mean, you can turn your car into like a university now. You've got so much things you can do and use that time well. These are wonderful tools. You know, I mean, like any tool, they can be used for good or bad. You know, take the cars weren't, you know, only been around for just a little over 100 years. Uh, uh, cars can be, as an, was a new technology and can be used for a lot of good to get us around places, but they can also do a lot of harm. Think how many people have been killed by automobiles. Of course, it wasn't, the, you know, it's usually the driver. Or think of phones. I mean, phones, who, uh, uh, phones were a new technology and, Think of the good they can do. We can reach people and, and without having to travel there and, and or with your kids. And, but phones can also be used for great harm by spreading vicious and bad gossip. Again, it's just a tool. It can be used for good or for ill. Either way. Now if we could just get people to quit using their cell phone while they're driving, it would be nice. But I don't know how many close calls I've had with someone and they go by and they're on their cell phone and, but anyway, all right, enough on that. Media, uh, uh, under conclusion here, just a few things. First, never stop learning, really. You're never too old to learn some new things. That's for sure. I mean, don't, and don't let your info become outdated and stale. You know, some people know a lot, but it's like that old saying, you know, uh, by the time I finally learned all the answers, you know, they changed all the questions. Um, that happens. Keep learning. Just keep learning. Uh, it's said now that if you get a PhD in a particular area, let's say chemistry or something, that the information, if you don't keep learning, that's all outdated in about five years. So if you may be, you know, go, I have my PhD in this, but if you haven't kept up with everything in that area, man, the stuff you know is, 
it's not hardly even useful anymore. It's outdated that quickly. So we have to keep learning. Or um, a second, remember all truth is God's truth. He's the God of truth. Never be afraid to pursue truth. You know, you're not going to find something that will disprove God. You just won't. Uh, be like a good uh, detective. You know, follow the evidence all the way. Uh, ask the hard questions. A real Christian is never, ever afraid of the hard question. You may not have the answer. I mean, we don't know, all, you know, but there, there are answers out there. Never be afraid of the tough question. When someone puts that down or speaks, you know, acts like they, they are, or that we shouldn't ask such questions, that really speaks poorly about, really it says a lot about them. Too bad some think it says something about Christianity. It really doesn't. But So I'll never be afraid of the tough questions. And remember, Christianity and good science are not in conflict. They really aren't. When the evidence is followed to the end and, and looked with, that, with an open mind, you'll see the evidence best fits the scriptural pattern and the scriptural words here. And then third, use your minds. You like that old commercial, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. It is, isn't it? Yeah, use it. Uh, uh, don't return it to the Lord unused, you know. You can't, at the end of your life, sell your brain on eBay, eBay saying, you know, good brain, barely used, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, use it. And to uh, uh, be thankful you have one. I can remember a few years back I had a head x-ray. I can't remember what it was, why I had one. Anyway, I remember seeing the pictures of my the head x-ray and the doctor was looking at it. And as soon as I looked at it, I said, I told him, well, this confirms what many people have said. I have no brains, uh, you know, because an x-ray just shows the skull and the rest is empty. And uh, well, that's because when the Lord was handing out brains, I thought he said pains and I said, no, I don't want any. Use your minds. One day a carpenter left his shop and he changed jobs and he began to teach. And think what our world would be like if he had not changed jobs. There would be no, no New Testament. There would be no gospel in that sense. There would be no crucifixion. There would be no resurrection. There would be no Christians teaching others. I mean, the very, and the very reason why Oxford and Yale and Cambridge uh, even began would not exist. I mean, the impact on, of Jesus on education is beyond imagination. Uh, so, for your, well, for your education, thank a teacher, but also thank the Lord. This is another area where we need to get back to Jesus and try to catch up with Jesus and his high view of, again, loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind as well. We're to love God with all our minds. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that in, in all these areas, your impact is just unbelievable. There's, there's never been somebody like you. And we think of the, what you did and, and the great love you demonstrated for us by dying on the cross for us, then being raised with power, proving that you were the Son of God. And so, Lord, our faith, our hope is in you. Lord, help us to follow faithfully in your footsteps. We still have not caught up with you even in this education area. And, and there's so much more to learn, so much more to know about the world that you have made. So Lord, I help us to be people who, who love the truth and cherish that. And we seek that out. Because it all comes from you. You're the God of truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, help us to be people who, who love you, who love what you've made, because it speaks so, so much about you and your power and your wisdom. So, Lord, as we go forth from here, help us to, to never stop learning more about you, about what you've done for us, about your world, because it all, it all praises you. And so, thank you. And help us to be alert, too, to people you bring across our path this week, so many are hurting and carrying heavy loads and heavy burdens, and you invite them all to come to you, and they can find rest. So, Lord, help us appoint others to you this week. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus.